Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the sunny Northwest. Man, uh, we were really looking forward to doing a barbecue out there, and uh, part of me was a little like, oh, man, it's raining. But then um, I remember that we've been praying for rain just because of all the, all the crazy fires and stuff. And so, man, I just wanted to... Um, I don't know, celebrate, that's an answer to prayer. Can I pray real quick for all the, all the firemen, all the people that are working on so hard and sacrificing so much in our state? Would you guys mind just praying with me for them and thanking them for their, their work? Lord, we're, we're just so thankful for rain. We want more of it to stop these fires and to keep people's homes and, and um, livelihoods and uh, firemen safe. Um, you're, you're so good to us, Lord. I just pray that this would be a real blessing uh, for our state. Um, bless us today as we kind of just jump into the word together. Um, and soften our hearts to hear what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in the book of Mark, and we're asking the question, who is Jesus? In fact, Mark, who's the author of this, he's kind of Jesus, one of Jesus' biographers, writing and trying to figure out who Jesus is, and it's so interesting. He doesn't just blatantly come out and say like, exactly who Jesus is. He tells this long story uh, at a very quick pace to help us understand who Jesus is. And I think that question, who is Jesus, is a crucial question. I think like there's a lot of misconceptions about Jesus. Jesus has been one of the most controversial figures in history. Um, when people think about Jesus, they can think about tall buildings, they can think about uh, judgment, they can think about you know, primarily sin, they can think about... Um, they can think about like maybe uh, we've seen pictures of them in the past in this series of you know stoner Jesus, some of the old pictures of Jesus kind of stoned out, you know, uh, given the peace sign. Uh, there's really happy Jesus. There's Norwegian, you know, blonde, uh, blue-eyed Jesus. Um, the, the the question who is Jesus is one of the most important questions you'll ever answer. And um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I thought I'd show a video that might uh, pinpoint some misconceptions that people have about Jesus. Just check this out. Do you think he can fly? Shh. Here he comes. Well, all right. Now it's time for me to tell you all what you've done wrong since I last saw you. And don't try and hide because I'm Jesus. I will find you. Let's start with you, Peter. You lied to your mother the other day. Andrew, you said a naughty word when you hit your finger with the hammer. James, you laughed at him when he hit his finger. Moving right along, John, you drank too much wine the other night. Not way too much, just enough to make me angry. Matthew, we fell asleep in church, didn't we? Yes, we did. And Thomas, you were slow dancing a little too close with that girlfriend of yours. Let's see, and you, I forgot your name, so you're off the hook for now. Um, hmm. Philip, I saw you smoking a cigarette behind that big rock the other day. Thaddeus, I hate to say I saw you stick up your middle finger at someone who cut you off when you were riding your camel. Benjamin, you aren't wearing your WWJD bracelet. Jacob, I don't mind you saying my name, but not after you stub your toe. And Frank, you know what you did. I just can't repeat it because I'm Jesus. All right, all you sinners, come with me. It's time to pay the piper. Man, it was only one cigarette. I heard that. Look at all these sinners. All right, listen up. Listen to me, I'm Jesus. Listen to what I have to say. I have done many wonderful things. I have healed many people of diseases. I have performed many miracles so that I can tell you this. You're all evil. There is no hope. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Oh, man. Um, that's what a lot of us feel like when we come to church sometimes, or if we've got, um, you know, religious family members. If you've grown up, um, uh, maybe in church, maybe you've experienced that feeling of, I don't know, condemnation, guilt. Um, some of us have. Um, some of you guys might have a great experience with, with Christ. You might have a great experience with the church, and you like, and you know this is a joke. And then there's some people who have grown up um, in, a, in, a, in a life that's been very far from God. 
and you, you haven't been close, you haven't had too many Christian friends. In fact, you know, the, the fact that you're here today, whether you believe or not, is, is kind of a miracle. And um, that might be hitting on some things when we ask the question, who is Jesus? A lot of feelings come up like this. Even though we're laughing, I think it's funny because it hits some things that we might actually feel. Um, we're in Mark chapter two, and um, there's this really interesting thing going on. Jesus is doing ministry, and everybody's trying to figure out who he is. He's healing people, and so people like see him as a miracle worker. They see him as this magician. Um, he's teaching. He's teaching from the Bible like, like they've never seen before, so a lot of people are coming to him for his Bible teaching, and people are trying to figure out who he is. No one gets it. The only people who really get it are ones who are demon-possessed, and the demons are saying, you're the Lord, you're the Son of God, and Jesus is like, I don't want you representing me. Shut up. Quiet down. And so no one can quite figure it out, but he's causing a lot of tension. And when he's, um, when he's doing ministry, he's doing things that, that just baffle people, especially religious people of his day. I mean, uh, one story that we enter here in chapter two uh, has Jesus hanging out in a, in a disciple who's a sinner. He's a new disciple. His name's Matthew. He ends up writing a book. But at this point, he's a tax collector and he hangs out with a bunch of sinners. And he's not a, you know, a typical religious guy. And uh, Jesus goes to his house to hang out with them. And there's all these sinners that are hanging out with Matthew because he's friends with them. And Jesus is sitting there right in the thick of it at the table eating with sinners, dinner with sinners. And all of a sudden, um, Pharisees are there too because they want to see his teaching. They want to scrutinize him. And they see him sitting with all these people. And uh, it becomes really clear the way they see the world. Um, Did you know that where you stand determines what you see? Where you stand in life determines how you see the world. And they see the world very differently than Jesus because they get upset when they see him. They see him with all these sinners and they freak out and they start talking amongst themselves and they go talk to the disciples. They don't talk to Jesus directly. They go and talk to his disciples indirectly and they're just like, why is he hanging out with such scum? Why is he hanging out with these people? Because you have to understand from their perspective, The way they saw the table, the way they saw the home was a sacred place of division. It was a sacred place of division. If you um, were a sinner, you were out. If you were a saint, if you were someone who really followed the Torah, if you were good with them, then you were in. Uh, They saw the home, they saw the table as as a religious sacred place of division where if you're good, you can be here and if you're bad, you should be out. So Jesus is hanging out with all these sinners, it doesn't make sense because in, in the way they've been taught that in religion, especially um, in their day and age, that they saw that sin was an infection. So if you hung out with sinners, what would happen? You'd catch it. You'd catch the disease of sin. So they wanted to distance themselves and separate themselves whenever they saw what they saw as sin. Um, so they were always about who's in, who's out, who's the sinner, who's the saint, who's sick and who's well. And so that, that, was, that was largely what motivated them. They see Jesus hang out with sinners. They're like, he's getting infected. This is gross. He's not a real teacher. This, you, know, you, you have to believe and change so that you can belong with us. But Jesus has this statement. He looks at them. He knows what they're thinking. He knows what they've said. And he says this to them. Healthy people. This is in uh, chapter 2, verse 17. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know that they're sinners. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people need a doctor. How many of you guys know that? Jesus, he he sees through things in such a way that just blows every paradigm uh, that the sinners and the saints, the Pharisees and the tax collectors, either side of the aisle, he sees things in a way that causes tension for all of them because he's right in the middle of it with, with, with liars and with the Pharisees, and sometimes you can't tell the difference if you read the stories, but it's, but it's this principle that Jesus has, this grace principle, and he believes that if you watch his life, that you can belong with him even before you believe. If you guys know that, that Jesus, he, he practices that you can believe, but you can have a small faith or even no faith, but even if you don't believe, if you belong, if you hang out with him, it's Okay. We had some people had a block party yesterday. It was raining, you know, kind of the same thing that was going on, but it was a really heavy wind, but they, they decided we're still gonna do our block party because we invited all our neighbors, and it's a place of belonging. You don't have to believe what we believe. You don't have to practice what we practice for you to come eat some burgers with us. 
come hang out, and they invited their whole neighborhood, and the rain kind of, you know, stopped some people from coming out, but they made the decision, look, we could just call it and call it off, but we want our neighbors to know that even if it's raining, even if it's awful weather, that we're going to be here for them. We're not going anywhere. This is a place you can belong before you believe. And uh, they had neighbors come out, people they'd never met before. They started relationships, started getting to know stories of other people, and, and that's our church. In case you didn't know this, Whitewater started with block parties, started with just places of belonging, and, and I never want that to stop. And we see Jesus doing that here, and it's freaking people out. So why does Jesus do this? And how can he get away with it? Why, how does he see the world so that he can live in this tension where everybody sees a house, you know, the religious people that they see it as a place of division, he sees it as a place of uniting people, bringing people together and healing them. If, you, if we jump to the beginning of, of chapter two, there's a story I just think is, it's one of the most powerful stories in, in scripture for me. Um, and I want to tell it today. And I want us to just pull a few things out, uh, a few things out of, this, out of this passage. But it says in chapter two, verse one, it says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. People want to know who he is. People want to be healed. Pe- people want to be changed. They want hope. And they, they're living in a world of just dominoes where their life is out of control and they're just a domino getting knocked over. And they, and they want to know that there's some hope. They want to know that maybe there's a way outside of this world that just seems so determined. If you're poor, you're going to stay poor. If you're wealthy, you get to be wealthy. The wealthy control the poor. The ones who are holy, they, they're, they're the ones who are better than the sinners. And so there's this huge separation and the way they live their lives is controlled by this system and they want hope. And all these people are packing in, but no one knows who he is. And as an aside, I just want you to know something really important to give you some context for this story. Um, Mark is telling the story and, you, and as you're reading Mark, if you've never read it, you should. And if you start reading, you start feeling like, man, Mark, why don't you just come out and say exactly who Jesus is? Say what it means that he's the son of God. Say the, the, that he was the creator, God, that, that he was there from the beginning. He's gonna be there at the end. Why don't you explain everything? Have you ever read the Bible and just wanted the Bible just to, just to just explain this all? You guys have just wanted that? Like, I, I don't get this. You know, you're reading about Methuselah and you're like, who's Methuselah? He was, how old? 800, what? Melchizedek? I don't know. Um, there's people that are, that are longing to to know who Jesus is, and as a reader, we want Mark to tell us. But there's something, there's a reason why he doesn't, and I, I think it's this. I think uh, if you look at the ancient Jewish tradition, when they, when they wrote or talked about God, there was this reality of God in their hearts and lives that they couldn't, they knew they couldn't, they couldn't explain him well enough. That his, whatever they named him wouldn't be adequate to describe his glory and his goodness and his love and his justice, how wonderful God was. And so they had this one name that was the highest name, the closest we can get to understanding how they might have pronounced it was Yahweh, but we don't know because the scribes, um, the, the ancient leaders of Israel never would say this name because it was, it was so holy. They wouldn't speak it. They couldn't say it directly. So the best way they could really try to describe God and and really uh, help people understand his identity and understand his identity in their hearts was either to use other words, other names that that, that meant like most high or the God of heaven's armies. They'd use all these different terms trying to get at this thing, but they couldn't say it because it was so holy. And the other way they'd really describe God is through stories. They couldn't say his name directly, so they'd tell stories. He's the great I am, Yahweh. We don't really know how it would have sounded because they kind of hid the name in mystery. And when you read Mark, he's picking up on that ancient pattern and he won't tell us explicitly. He won't tell us directly because Jesus is so holy and so amazing we couldn't wrap our minds around him. All he can do is tell his story. And this is one of the most amazing stories of all. So Jesus is moving and all these people are packing into this home and it's so packed that, that like there's no more room. And while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head and then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. I want to stop there for a moment. When I think of this, I'm imagining these men, like these four guys who have had this friend for a long time. In fact, I could see them knowing this friend before he was paralyzed. 
before the accident hap- had happened. And uh, this story for me is so uh, personal because um, I've had friends who have been hurt and damaged in a way that like, if I could give anything, family members, if I could give anything, I would have them healed. How many of you guys have family members or friends that you, you just long to see healed from this disease or this um, infirmity that they have? There's these friends in here that, they, that have known this guy and they love him so much, they have so much um, character that they, they want him to be healed no matter what. So they hear about Jesus. They don't even fully know who he is. They just know he's a miracle worker, he's a teacher, but to them the most important thing is that this guy might be able to heal my friend. Our, our friend, was, he was damaged. You guys saw what happened to him. You've seen, you've seen how it damaged his, his life and how it changed his whole life and his livelihood. And he, has to, he has to depend on other people's generosity to survive, how it changed his marriage, how it changed his relationship with his kids. And in this day and age, people also added on that, um, that this idea that maybe he deserved to be paralyzed because of some sin that he had, that it had caused him to be paralyzed. So he, he lived with a little bit of condemnation, but these friends who knew him and loved him wanted him home. Whole. And they, they were gonna they were gonna take the, their friend to Jesus. And I love that they they try to get in, but the room's packed, like the house is packed. Because remember, Jesus sees the house as a place to unite people, not divide them. And they can't even get in, it's so packed. And so like they, I could see them just being like, well, we're not gonna be able to get them in today. We're we're done. And one friend saying, No, we're not. This, you, you remember when he stood for us when no one else would. You know we wouldn't be the same people. If he wasn't in our life, we're gonna get him to Jesus today. Let's go to the roof, boys. So they go to the roof. And I just see like one big one who didn't talk much, you know, kind of carrying most of the load, setting him down, and like, and just being like, we're digging through the roof, guys. And just, you know, Bruno just all of a sudden starts hammering the ground, you know, clawing. He's not using tools or anything. Because he loves his friend and he wants him to, to meet Jesus, he wants him to be healed. And the other guys like, no, 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 let's grab some tools. And they just start, they just start grabbing a, you know, a pick or whatever they have and then their hands a knife and just starting to chop away at this roof in Israel. And you see, it says Jesus was teaching God's word and as he's teaching God's word and God's word says, and all of a sudden this you know, ceiling tile starts to crumble in. I imagine I'm preaching. If that started happening here, I'd start freaking out. I wouldn't preach a very good sermon. Jesus is way more amazing than me and way more patient. I'd be like, someone get up there and stop what's going on. And this stuff starts crumbling and he has to like dust off his scroll or whatever. Begin again. And the word of the Lord says, and then boom, another you know, chunk of rock falls and all this dust is starting to fall. What's going on? And then boom, and then, you know, Bruno's hand comes right through the ceiling. His fist is there. <clears throat> Pops it out and you just see him pop his head in big bearded face looking through and and Jesus is like, hello? <laughs> Someone thought it was the Holy Spirit coming through. Nope, Bruno. And all of a sudden, they widen the hole a little bit, and everyone's trying to get out of the way because all this dust and debris is falling. No one knows what's going on, and all of a sudden, they see this mat. I imagine like with strings or some, some, some way of slowly, tenderly, these big, rugged, probably fishermen, at least farmers, rugged guys, calloused hands, gently compassionately lowering their friend to the ground in front of Jesus. And I don't know, I just, I, that image just sticks in my head more than anything in this story of compassionate faith. Compassionate faith that we, they love this man enough that they're willing to do anything for him. I, my mom went through uh, some sickness. My wife went through some sickness recently and man, I, w- I would give anything to heal her. And these guys are so, they're not focused on themselves. They don't care what people think. They just tore a hole through someone's roof and lowered their friend down. I love the response of Jesus. It says this. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Seeing their faith. Not just this man who's been laid before him, who's been paralyzed for who knows how long and has had to suffer, live a a lifestyle um, subpar to like everyone else, seen as subpar to everyone else. And he looks at him and he looks at them and their faith and says, my son, your sins are forgiven. I love Jesus. Whatever he was teaching on, whatever he was preaching, roof starts caving in. He's like, oh, God's doing something. The lesson's changed t- today, friends. 
we're gonna be talking about something different. And this is the lesson. This paralyzed man's in front of him. What does this man want? What's he longing for? What are his friends longing for? And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, which is great, which is cool. But Jesus, we just dug through a roof so you'd heal him. Could you heal him? Forgiveness is great. Could you heal him? If only he could walk. You could see the, the paralyzed guy kind of leaning up and be like, like it means a lot. There's this moment I'm, he's forgiven, this powerful thing. If only I could walk. My life would change. My life would be back. I could work. I could be with my family. I wouldn't have judgment on me all the time. If only I could walk. And I think, and Jesus forgives him before healing him. He forgives him first because, for a reason. I think, I think the reason's this, that whenever we come to Jesus to be healed, there's something deeper to be revealed. Like we live in a life, we live lives that say, if only God would do this for me. Or if only I had this, my life would be perfect. If only I, I, I conquered this addiction. If only I had this person in my life, everything would be fine. If only I had this job. If only, if only and Jesus is recognizing that there's a deeper sickness than just what, what is seen in the hearts of everyone. He sees this man. He sees what is called sin. He says that your sins are forgiven. Your sin. He recognizes that there's such a thing as br- human brokenness and sin on the interior that you can't see like you can see a par- paraplegic or quadriplegic or someone with an illness. It's not something you can see on the outside so much. It's on the interior. It's a core thing. It's a character thing. It's at the heart of humanity, and Jesus can see it. But I love that Jesus, he's teaching in this moment to Pharisees who would, who would see someone who's you know, a sinner and paralyzed and his ruffian friends, they just wanna send him away and separate because when you see sin, it'll make you sick. Let's get it out of here. Let's quarantine it. But Jesus sees deeper. He sees both the sin and the faith. He sees their compassion, and compassion is simply this, helping someone, being willing to help someone, actually helping someone in an unexpected way at your own expense. At your own expense, looking at a, at a situation and coming in and doing what no one else would do. Who would, cl- who would think to cloth through a roof to Jesus? These guys did because they had compassion. Jesus sees that. He sees the good. He sees the bad. He sees us at our worst and loves us the most because he has a vision of what we could be, of what we should be, of what he's planned for us the lives he he wants for us. And it's not all daisies and roses, but he knows the type of person he wants us to be. He knows what he wants us to become, and what we're becoming is more important than just what we're doing. Do you understand the difference? And Jesus sees this situation, and it just blows me away. Your sins are forgiven. But when we want to be healed sometimes, we we want the surface thing. We we don't want him to reveal something deeper. We, we, We want the if onlys. If only God, if only, if only. Some of us today, if we were honest, we've built our life on if onlys. And we've gone from, oh, if if only I had this. If only this girl was with me. If only this guy liked me. If only, uh, you know, I made it through school, really, this school in particular. If I got through this school, if only I had that, then it'd be great. If only, um, you know, I could put, I could put our house back together, our family back together. Everything would be great. The problems would be gone. Anytime we try to build our life on the if only separate from Jesus, that's, that's really ultimately sin because we're saying if only I was in charge and could do what I wanted separate from God. And see, sin has this way of creeping in. Sin has this, in this culture, it's not so much a weight that we carry that Je- in this story, it's more of a stain that just, it, it stains our whole life. How many of you guys know that sin, brokenness, like that will to, to be king, that will to be God, the will to, man, if only I could find my significance in these things. How many of you guys know that goes nowhere, ultimately? We can have those things, and those aren't bad things, but if that's, our, if that's the God thing, if that's the only thing, it, dis, it ends up not only letting us down, but it can destroy us. Sin is a stain. I remember, remember one time uh, we had people over and my mom makes this blackberry pie. It's super good. You guys like blackberry pie? 
I mean, it was like fresh pick from our backyard. My mom makes the best crust. She learned this crust, a special crust from our family secret. My grandma made it. She had a pie store. I mean, it's this ancient pie store recipe. Everyone's eating it, loving it, and then someone like gets excited telling a story, and they go like this, and they throw this precious pie to the floor. My mom sees it, and she's thinking, oh, my floor. My dad sees it, and he's like, oh, my pie. <laughs> and it got like all in the carpet. And my dad rushed in. He's like, I got it, Elaine. He grabbed a towel, and he said he just started rubbing it, trying to rub it. All the, all the ladies in Cal are just like, oh, no. Guys are like, yes, rub it out and eat it. He starts rubbing this thing. What happens when you start rubbing blackberry pie in the carpet, trying to get it out? It spreads. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. See, Jesus knows as it is with blackberry pie in the rug, so it is with sin. When we're trying to rub it out on our own, we're trying to clean ourselves up, get our lives in order with the if onlys. If only I had this, it would fix everything. We're just rubbing it in worse. It's spreading. Only Jesus can forgive. Only Jesus can forgive. It goes on in verse six. It says, but some teachers of religious law, some Pharisees were sitting near... And they thought to themselves, what is he saying, this blasphemy? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. They know this. They've read the scriptures. Only God can forgive sins. Who is this miracle magic teacher man saying he can forgive sins? See, the the Pharisees are so blind that they miss the compassionate faith that's happening in front of them. These men helping their friends and having faith that somehow maybe Jesus can help them. He doesn't see this, they they don't see this paraplegic in front of them. They look beyond that. They look beyond the fact that Jesus is giving some hope and, and, and they're angry with him. You can't forgive him. That's blasphemy. What they're saying is that's sin. You saying you can forgive sin is sin. You can't forgive sin, Jesus. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, and he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? He knew it was in their heart. Jesus can always see into our hearts. Is it, it is easy, uh, or is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up and pick up your mat and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. In the middle of this packed place, you know, Pharisees looking, you know, people who are just like from the town watching, you know, like this gunfight, like, you know, spiritual gunfight that's happening. Kapah! You know? They're like, oh my gosh. And then the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked through the, uh, through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Guys, there's some, a few significant things I want to pull out of here, and I want to give you an invitation. When this happens, I mean, this guy gets up and walks out. People who have known him, who have seen him their whole lives are like, I know he can't walk, and he just got up, grabbed the mat he's laid on forever, and walked out of here. Like, they're like backing away from Jesus at this point. Like, that's cool, but I'm gonna stand over here. I'm a little freaked out by this. The Pharisees are like blown away because they've just said only God can, can forgive. And Jesus basically says, hey, which is harder? Which is more difficult? Which do you think is more difficult? Forgiving or healing? See, if it's like a simple, I forgive you for hurting my feelings or like, you know, healing someone from some major disease, I think it's pretty obvious which is easier. But Jesus isn't just saying I'm forgiving like a little sin, like I'm forgiving you for coming through the ceiling. Are you kidding me? Jesus is saying you are forgiven. The stain has been removed. The thing, you know, the if only scrub that was making it worse is getting taken out and I'm taken out. And not only am I forgiving you, I'm healing you as well. Um, why does Jesus do that? And why don't the Pharisees see it for what it is? Why don't they see it? Because I think this is the answer, friends. This is the connection, both of the paralyzed man, the Pharisees, everyone who doesn't understand of Jesus, this is it. They're sick and they don't know it. They're sick and they don't know it. And that, that's why they're like, Only God can forgive sins. Duh, he is God. Mark is saying, he's like, this is Yahweh. I can't say Yahweh. I can't say how magnificent he is. I can't explain it, so I'm gonna tell his story. And Mark is saying, this is the living God. He's the only one who can forgive. 
And like all of a sudden goosebumps start going on in the room because they realize what's going on. People are starting to catch, whoa, he's not just a miracle man. This might be the son of God. In this room right now, we need to know that this is the son of God, the only one who can forgive, the only one who can remove the, the, the sickness of sin that we're all, like most of the time, we're unaware of. Some of us are in the room and we're sick. We don't know it. We might think, oh, if only I had this and this is a problem that I have and this uh, addiction issue, girl issue, husband issue, this issue, that, you know, those, all these issues. But underneath it, and Jesus sees the real issue, that we're sick and we're don't, we don't know it. And so I would say the other reason Jesus forgives first, I mean, because if you think about it, why did Jesus, he healed all these people in stories before this, but he didn't forgive them and then heal them. Why this pattern, heal and forgive? It's totally breaking the pattern. Why did Jesus do that? Here's why I think. And Jesus is seeing their hearts and what he's doing by forgiving, he's making them mad. They're like, what is going, it's unexpected. You can't say that. And he's digging a hole through the roof of their hearts. Just makes sense. He's digging a hole through the roof of their heart. He's trying to get into the core because not only does he love, you know, the paraplegic and his friends and everybody in that room, he even loves the jerk Pharisees, the religious guys who want to separate everyone and be better than everyone. He still loves them because everyone has a sin, sickness problem. We just usually aren't aware of it. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, he he makes himself vulnerable, just like he makes himself vulnerable right now in front of these Pharisees by forgiving and pulling out this card that they never expected and it blows their mind and they're getting upset and then he heals this guy and what he wants them to see is that he's the God, the only God who can forgive their sins. That he can heal them and he loves them. So when we look at the cross, the cross is Jesus digging a hole through heaven to into earth to lower us at the foot of God. Like God just... He saw that we were sick. He saw that we were like the paralyzed guy. He saw that we couldn't do anything for ourselves. We couldn't heal ourselves. We couldn't, we couldn't rub the, the, the stain long enough. We couldn't fix it on our own. He saw that we're, the, we're the, in a sinful way. We're like the paralyzed guy. And, and Jesus digs through the roof by being nailed to the cross. And he lowers us to the, to the foot of the Father God who forgives us and heals us. Friends, that's the good news. That's the good news. So I wanted to put a challenge out. Those of you who have been sick and hurting and there are real things, man, if only, like those are big things. Maybe you need to look a little deeper and ask God to help your soul, your heart. Ask for forgiveness. Get the stain out. Some of us have been rubbing that, that, that blackberry stain so bad. We've been trying to get rid of that sin in so many ways. Going to church, praying, or being nicer, not swearing, and all this stuff. But you guys, that's not, that's not going to get you very far. The only one who can forgive sins, remove the stain, is Jesus. He did it on the cross. He bled for us. And Isaiah, it says that he took on all our sickness so that we could be made well. That's who this God is. And I want to I wanna invite you, if maybe you're... You identify with the Pharisees and the, when you, you can't help it when you walk into a room, you see like them and you, you see a dividing line and, and, and it's frustrating because you, you can't even, you're frustrated with yourself at times because you can't even see the awesome kingdom moments. Like you miss the moments where these men like lower someone to the ground and they're having compassion. You don't, it doesn't, it doesn't move you. You, 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 you see the problem. You see that sin is an infection and, and if someone's really sinning, you, you just wanna, you wanna get them out. You see churches that bug you. You wanna see theology or preachers or a different style of church. You, you wanna divide. You wanna push it away. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's usually symptoms of someone who's sick and doesn't know it. Some of us are sick and we don't know it. And today's an opportunity to have the blood of Christ cleanse us. His wounds make us whole. So I'd ask if you're someone who's new on, on your spiritual journey and you're headed toward faith, you want to put your faith in Christ, you've been, you've been wanting to do that, you just didn't know how, this is how, it is, this is how you do it. It says in this story, it says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. When God sees your faith, when you respond in faith and say, Jesus, I'm going to believe in you the best I know how, your sins are removed. Your sins are removed. All the baggage, 
the stuff underneath the stuff is taken away. The stain is gone. New carpet is put in. And you become the paraplegic that Jesus heals. So if you would, if this is the first time you want to commit your life to Christ Jesus, be forgiven, have new life, get rid of sin, I would invite you to pray this prayer after me. This is your prayer. I'm just praying a prayer that might be helpful. So you can, you can uh, say this in the quiet of your heart. You can say it out loud. I don't care. But I would ask you to pray this prayer after me if you want to step into faith with Jesus and be healed. If you're here, don't be afraid. He is, he is the living God, the only one who can forgive you. Go and bow your head and pray after me if this is you. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sin. Lord, I ask that you would come into my life and change me. You'd heal me. Lord, I want to recognize that there's been sin in my life that I wasn't aware of or I was trying to pretend like it wasn't there. And Lord, I just confess that to you. I'm a mess at times and I need you so bad. For Jesus, I want to commit my life to you the best I know how. I want to believe in you the best I know how. Come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And I would say to those of you who want, need to recommit, I mean, you've been following Christ, but you've kind of gotten off the path, and there's, there's a lot of stains in the carpet, and you need to get your heart right with him and get back on track. I would ask that you'd, um, you'd pray this prayer after me. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads one more time and pray this prayer. Father God, I just, man, I've, I don't know how, I don't know why, but I've gotten away from you. Would you help me come back? Would you remove the, the stain of, of sin in my life? Would you help me to have faith? Would you help me to walk with you? I recommit my life to you, Jesus. Amen. Would you keep your heads down for just a moment? If you made a decision for the very first time today, would you just look at me? The first time today, just, just go ahead and look at me. I just want to be praying for you. If you made a, this is your a recommitment to Christ today, would you just look at me? Go ahead and look me in the eyes. Mm, I see you guys. Go ahead and lift your heads. Man, I'm so happy. If, there's people here who have been carrying burdens had stains in their life and, and, and Jesus is removing them today. I'm gonna ask that we, uh, we worship now and as we sing these songs, be thinking about these words and what they mean for your life and for your faith. All right, let's go.